I continue on in, 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 in the series that I'm doing about speaking and, and talking about today, a time to speak. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible version. There is a season for everything and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. You know, all gardeners know that. And I do it on a regular basis. You bring in one crop and, and then you take it out when it gets past its prime. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. Well, today it is a day, a time to speak. A time to keep silent may come. You know, there may be a, there may be a time sometime in the future where it will be highly appropriate uh, a time to keep silent. But today it's a time to speak. And what should I speak about? What should you speak about at this time? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19 in the Amplified Bible version. And here we have, you know, this, the, the whole book of Deuteronomy was given. It's a rehearsal in the ears of God's people just before they cross over Jordan into their promised land about some of the most important things they should keep in mind, of what they should know as they begin a new life. So Moses says this here, because this, Moses is the one who wrote it, and he's speaking, he's the active voice here, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, 30 in verse 19. He says, Today I ask heaven and earth to witness. I am offering you life or death, blessings or cursings. Now choose life then you and your children may live. So Moses is making this point, and he's speaking to the people in the, in the place of God. He's speaking for God in this place, and he's making this, this choice. He says he, he's offering them life or death, but he's saying choose life that you and your children may live. Now, it follows immediately, and what does it mean to choose life? And in verse 20 it says, to choose life is to love the Lord your God, obey him. That means listening to his voice, and some translations will have that, but listening to his voice means obeying him. It's not just that you're hearing what he has to say, but you hear and you respond to what you hear. So to love the Lord your God, obey him, and stay close to him. That is to cling to him, to, be, you know, to, to, to want to be in constant fellowship with him. An association. In old covenant times, God saved his people, the Israelites, by grace. You know, that's the whole point of Exodus in the chapters 1 through verse uh, chapter 19. God then gave the Israelites, the people he chose to be his people, his chosen people, to walk with him in the newness of life. And he strongly urges them to choose life which meant to love him with all the heart, soul, and mind, and to obey him, to staying you know, close with him, clinging to him. This is the story of this walking newness of life, what proceeds from Exodus 20 onwards. Now, for both the Old Covenant and New Covenant people of God, and I want to point this out because it's very important, because this, this fact has been obscured by many, it is only after we've become the Lord's people due to his mercy, due to his grace that he shows us that we can by faith walk with him, walking as it were, this is a great symbol, walking with him hand in hand in his way of righteousness, which means, you know, 
as the Psalms say, all his commands are righteousness. Walking in with God in his way of righteousness, it means to walk with him in obedience to his will as revealed by his word. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 4, 4, man doesn't live by bread alone, just not, not by material sustenance, but by every word of God. And this is the word of God. And we're looking at the word of God today to see about this time to speak. It shows you here very clear. It's turned in the uh, New Covenant Scriptures and the general epistles of the Apostle John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. By this standard, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God. What is the love of God? That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, that's totally contrary. That's 100 degrees contrary to what you will hear. I don't, you know, literally hundreds of preachers say you can't keep the commandments of God. But that's not what the apostle John had to say. The apostle whom Jesus loved. The apostle who really assembled most of the new covenant scriptures, who wrote the last gospel to complete, as it were, the, the other uh, synoptic gospels, the three gospels, who wrote even the book of Revelation and his general epistles to make the point. For, his love, for, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, there is a tremendous theological distinction between teaching that one can earn salvation by obedience to the law and teaching that obedience to the law is the only essential response, is an essential response to that salvation. You know, I know it's a very interesting. David L. Baker in his book, uh, The Decalogue, Living as the People of God, he makes this point clearly. <laughs> there is a strong distinction between teaching that one can earn salvation by obedience to the word of God or that obedience to the word of God, God's law is our appropriate response to, to the salvation which he's graciously given us. As in the, in the, people of God, and if you happen to be a parent or a grandparent, it's your duty to speak. See, it's a time to speak. And when you're a parent, when you're a grandparent, you know, you have been given the time to speak. Or at least there are those teachable moments when you have the opportunity to instruct, to, to bring things up, to talk with your children or your grandchildren. This is very important. Because certainly in this world, in this present generation that we have right now, they're not going to get it in school. They probably aren't going to hear it from their peers. If they're going to hear anything about the word of God and the way of God, it's going to be from you. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, again, another part of this. You know, it was very clear, God is asking us to choose life, and choosing life means living by his word walking in this newness of life according to his revealed will. And it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 1, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. It said, You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. That's, you know, listen and obey to God's will. Keep in mind that I'm not talking now to your children who have never experienced the discipline of the Lord your God or seen the greatness of his strong hand and powerful arm. Yes, you, if, if you are a parent and you've been in the church for a, a considerable period of time, you have learned with, to some degree what it means to walk with God, haven't you? Don't we have experience from this? And we, this is experiences that we have. We need to share them with our children because we've experienced the discipline of the Lord our God you see, but the children haven't, or seen his greatness, or his strong hand and powerful arm. They didn't see the miraculous signs and wonders he performed to Egypt against Pharaoh and all of his land. They didn't see what the Lord did to the armies of Egypt and to their horses and chariots, how he drowned them in the Red Sea. 
when they were chasing you, he destroyed them and they had not recovered even to this very day. Moses was saying to the Israelites who were only teenagers, the oldest of them were teenagers by the time that they, you know, it was 40 years after they left Egypt and when they got to the Jordan River, they were standing there, you know, the oldest would have been close to 60. All the rest had died in the desert. They had experienced these things. It says, verse 5 here, Deuteronomy 11. Your children didn't see how the Lord cared for you in the wilderness until you arrived here. Yeah, they didn't, you know, how many of them, you know, the little kids, would they, you know, they, would they, did they know about the, you know, uh, the streams that God had, those, the, the waters that would come out of the rock or providing the manna for all those years? But those that Moses was speaking to, you know, there at the Jordan, they knew that they had that experience with God. Verse 6, they didn't see what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the descendant of Reuben, when the earth opened its mouth and the Israelite camp and swallowed them, along with their households and tents and every living thing that belonged to them. That was part of the discipline because they were speaking against the leadership. That con old you know, covenant congregation in the wilderness. They were, they were taking upon themselves things they should not have. But God does discipline his people. Verse 7, you have seen the Lord perform all these mighty deeds with your own eyes. See, this is what Moses was saying to his audience. You've seen how God works. You've seen how it works. Okay, so what, if you've seen all these things and your kids haven't, what's your responsibility? Your eyes have seen these things. You've seen what he's done. It says, therefore, verse 8 here, therefore, Moses is making the point, you know, because, therefore, because you've experienced God's salvation and his mercy, you've seen his kindness, you've seen how he's taking care of you, you've seen how he has disciplined people. In the course of your walk with God over the years, I have, over the last, you know, 40 plus years in the, amongst the people of God, I've seen how God deals with some of this. He says, because therefore, be careful to obey every command I'm giving you today. Jesus said, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, so that you may have strength to go in and take over the land that you are about to enter. See, they were going to enter our promised land. We are waiting for the kingdom of God. There is a world coming of which the disciples, the apostles spoke, of which was prophesied by the prophets. A time when God, the Messiah, our Lord, will be king of kings and this world will be different. So that you may have strength to go in and take over the land you are about to enter. If you obey, you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors and to you and to their descendants. Yeah, they had the promise of a long material life, physical life. We have the promise of an eternal life, a spiritual life. Talk about a long life, a life without end. Boy, that's what we want. Choose life. You see, when we are look at this, you know, the choice between for us is far greater than it was even for the ancient Israelites. For the land you're about to enter, he says, take over is not like the land of Egypt, which you came. And he said, you know, he's talking about how it's different, how it was very different, you know, the promised land as opposed to their experience in Egypt. But he's saying the land you're coming to they soon take over, a land of hills and valleys with plenty of rain, a land that the Lord your God cares for. He watches over it through every, each season of the year. They're, 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 verse 13, if you carefully obey the commands I'm giving you today, if you love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and soul, then, then he will send the rains in their proper seasons, the early and late rains, so that you can bring in your harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil, and they give you lush pasture land for your livestock, and you perhaps, <laughs> you yourselves, will have everything you want to eat. There are going to be good things that were, would follow. See, there is a difference, and he was saying, you, you know, you've seen all these things, your children have it, and he's going to make a point here very closely, you know, where we are right now, you know, 
we, we look at our world, if Angela Merkel really wanted to do something effective at the G20 meetings that are going on in Hamburg, Germany this weekend, and it really wanted to do something that would make a real difference in the climate change and to make this world happier, she would have urged their, the world's leaders to love the Lord, their God, the creator of this earth, and to serve him with all the heart and soul and to obey him. And then you'd really have such an effective program to resolve our climate change problems, to have a climate that would be more favorable to all of humanity. But they're not going to do that, are they? No, they won't. So he says here in verse 16, but be careful, don't let your heart be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. See, Moses is warning them, You've, you know, here you are, you're standing here with your kids. <laughs> you know, be careful, don't allow your heart to be deceived to worship something other than me. Most of the world, Western world right now, is worshiping something other than the God of creation. I've got to, I'll tell you straight up, they're not. Verse 17, if you do that, the Lord's anger will burn against you and you'll shut up the sky and hold back the rain and the ground will fail to produce its harvest and you'll die quickly in the good land the Lord is giving you. Yeah, you know, and you know what? They can, they can work all they want to start, you know, to reduce the levels of carbon dioxide. And I, I'll tell you, I promise you, it won't be enough, whatever they do, to change the, what, the problems that are going to come upon them. They don't want to hear that. They think it's all materialistic. They think there's no spiritual component in it. There's no moral component. They can choose death all they want. You know, we can have, you know, doctor-assisted suicide. We can kill our babies in the womb, you know, by the tens of millions, and it has no effect. No, that's not what God is going to say. We, put, we start substituting, turning our back on God. There are going to be problems, and they're sitting around and, you know, making carbon pricing and all this other stuff is, 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 is foolishness. Foolishness. Verse 18. Therefore, you shall, okay, he's saying to the people who are staying there, you've seen all this, you've heard what I've said against you, you've heard the consequences, you know the benefits, you, you know, I've ur I'm urging you to choose life. Says, Therefore, if you shall impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul and tie them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as, you know, as, 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 as almost something that you're wearing on your head, something that you've got on your hand, that you remind yourselves all the time we're walking in God's presence. God is hearing us. Remember Jesus said, by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. And we're on record, <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry about the NSA. <laughs> God is watching the NSA, <laughs> okay. He's hearing everything that they're cooking up and all the people are cooking up and the whatever. You know, God has the final say. He has the final say. But he's saying to impress these words of mine in your heart and your soul. You know, put them so that you're right here in the front of your head and that's your right hand so when you do stuff, you're doing things about God's way. And then it says here in verse 19, you shall teach them diligently to your children. That means, according to the Amplified, it says impressing God's precepts on their minds and penetrating their hearts with his truths. You know, you know teach them diligently to your children. Speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. You know, it's God is saying every teachable moment you can find, teach. You know, it's sort of like from this aspect. You know, one of us, uh, we read it to our kids when we were, uh, when our children were younger. We'd read Grant, Anne of Green Gables. And, you know, you had uh, the, one of the major... Uh, actors or one of the even in the current TV series uh, is Marilla Cuthbert and Marilla always has something to say she was always teaching and well this is this this is why you do this or whatever it might she has a moral to the story she was trying to take and she knew every possible teachable moment because of course Anne did need it <laughs> she did need it and Morella did have a background in the scriptures. Okay, this is character fiction, but 
the, the point is, is that she was using those opportunities, those teachable moments, to make a point. You'll teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. There is a time to speak. And God is saying we must speak because if we're going to choose life and we're, we want the good things for our children and our grandchildren, we must teach these things. You know, this is totally contrary to this modern, you know, progressively degenerating society where they, you know, they say, oh, well, we don't want to teach religion or anything to do with God or the Bible. You know, wait till they're full adults, you know, and then, then you let them show it. Rubbish! Double rubbish! <laughs> Putrid rubbish! That's not what God says. You have a responsibility. It is God given a time to speak when you have children and grandchildren. You really do. Be diligent about them, diligently. Of course, we have to practice them and do them ourselves. The worst possible thing you can have is a hypocritical, hypocritical teacher because I, I, I assure you, children, I don't know how, it's, it, it's, it, how it, it, it is encoded in their, hard-coded, hard-wired in their DNA. They can sense hypocrisy in any sort of sense. And they're right on it. They have fine-tuned when they're young. Now, when they get older, they practice it just, just as well as anybody else because they've learned, you know, from this standpoint. But when they're young, they see it. Teachers have a duty to speak. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4, expanded Bible version. The Lord gave me the ability to teach. That is the tongue, literally, the tongue of a learned one. Yeah, that's the kind of tongue I've got. Tongue of a learned one, you know, God is saying. This is prophet Isaiah. So that I know what to say to make the weak strong. Or the weary strong. Somebody who's been wearied by life walking along the way through what we've gone through. And it's hard not to be wearied by things that go on in the world. For sure. Every morning he wakes me. That is God. This is what prophet is saying. He teaches me. To listen like a student. Every when you're walking with God, hand in hand, you know He is a, it's an instructive, continuously instructive pro, uh, process, and we're going to be learning for eternity. Now let's go to Matthew chapter eleven and verse sixteen. Let's see who had a real tongue of a teacher. Tongue of a teacher. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 16. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Of course, who's speaking? The teacher of teachers. And he said this. Jesus of Nazareth, he said this. To what can I compare this generation? Now remember, the Bible is written. Jesus said it at that time. He said Matthew is recording it. But it's also prophetic. It's prophetic for our time right now just as well. I mean, he, Jesus spoke in prophecies. To what can I compare this generation is like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends, hey, we played wedding songs and you didn't dance. So we played funeral songs and you didn't mourn. In other words, we tried this, we tried that. And then, you know, you ignored it all. You're complacent. So what? Uh, And then he goes on in verse 18. He's going to make some specific references to his time. For John, that's John the Baptist, didn't spend his time eating and drinking. No, he was very much an ascetic. He lived out in the desert, and he had a, he had a very tough, disciplined, restricted life. Clothes on his back. You know, he, he was an ascetic. For John didn't spend his time eating and drinking, and you say he's possessed by a demon. I mean, obviously, he was out of the normal. And the Son of Man, referring to himself, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Okay, these are his critics, his contemporary critics, and they said that about him. Because Jesus, you know, went to dinner parties. He was invited out. 
he drank. I mean, what was his first miracle? He made lots of wine, not just five gallons. Five gallons times five gallons times five gallons times five gallons. He made a lot of good wine. And yeah, he sat down, a friend of tax collectors and other sinners, he sat down and talked with these people because he said, of course, who is it that needs a physician? It's the sick that need a physician, and these people are soul sick. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Wisdom is shown to be right by its results, okay? Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. And he says, you know, what sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did and you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, the people would have repented of their sins long ago and clothed themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their head to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on judgment day than you and you people of Capernaum. Will you be honored in heaven? No, you'll go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did and you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off. You know, Sodom, you know, of Sodom and Gomorrah fame, will be better off in the day of judgment than you, which is probably was, was pretty pointed. Probably would have upset. He said, Sodomites? Okay, you know, homosexuals from the, all these, these sorts of people, the things that were going on are going to be better off on these people who, you know, were making this great show of being religious. I tell you, even Sodom would be better off on Judgment Day than you, and that time Jesus pray, prayed this prayer, O oh, Father, Lord in heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. And you know, one of the great things about children is they are childlike. And that we have a time to reach when, when children will listen, when they'll hear. When they get to be older, they'll be like the people of, of Chorazan and Bethsaida and Capernaum, where they'll hear all these things and they'll say, oh, well, that's, that's cool. You know, hey, let's see another one. <laughs> Could you imagine that? If we were there, how about our time? Verse 26, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one knows, truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. There's this aspect that God, you know, he sows a seed. Who is, who, who is it the one he chooses to reveal him? It's not just all our doing by any means in preaching the gospel. God has his hand in this. He, has, he makes his choices. Verse 28, and then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Let me teach you. Any teacher in public school knows they can't get in a word edgewise unless the kids let them teach them. They'll be doing everything else. Pulling out their, you know, smartphones, doing their whatever, you know, talking with their friends, you know, throwing spit wads, uh, poking, the, you know, their neighbors, you know, ignoring whatever. If they have to, children to be taught in school these days, they want to learn anything. They have to let the teacher teach because teachers, of course, can't enforce discipline anymore. They can't take them out, you know, in the front of class and whack them with a paddle like it happened when we were kids. When I was a kid, we, we, we you know, it, the teachers didn't have to just let us let them teach. They demand it. Let me teach you, but Jesus said, because we do have free will. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If you let me teach you, you're going to find rest. Something in the society and all the things they ought to offer you and all their human rights that you can do this, you can that, you're not going to find, as Jesus said, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. But Jesus said this, you know, when he did all this, you know, there's an interesting point. And this is the major difficulty that we have today. If we go to Matthew here in chapter 11, let's go to just look a little earlier in the chapter at verse 6. And it says, it's written, 
and blessed, that is joyful or favored by God, is he who does not take offense at me, Jesus said. Didn't take offense at me as the Messiah. Doesn't take offense at me because of, of you know, of because I'm the Christ, of who I am and my teaching. Doesn't take offense at me. But people these days do take offense of, at God. They really do. There are many people who will take offense at me, Jesus. Ugh, just a number of years ago when this big uh, airliner, I guess it was a Swiss Air, crashed in the ocean off of, I think it was off of uh, uh, Nova Scotia or whatever, and they, they had a service, a memorial service, and they, they called in some Christian preachers and they said to them, this memorial service, we don't want you to mention the name of Jesus. You can't mention the name of Christ. You take offense at me. You know, any school district, public school district, you know, they'll allow their aboriginals to talk about the creator, but if a teacher got up there and mentioned the word Christ, Jesus, and something like that, or offered a prayer like they will sometimes in the, here in British Columbia, the ceremony to open something, talk about taking offense at me. It's, it's wow. It really would. They are offended by Jesus, and they are offended by his teaching. But when we have, if you're a parent or grandparent and you have the opportunity to teach your children, they're not old enough yet to take offense. They're still child enough, childlike enough that they'll hear and they'll listen. They won't take an offense. But later on, people do. They do get hardened, you know, from that aspect. So that even if Jesus was among them doing miracles, it's, you know, how many would repent of it? We must take those teachable moments and teach when we can. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. She, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. You see, we, there is a time to speak. And God, has specifically, he even created offices in the church that were responsible for this. He did. It's in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, expanded Bible version, and Christ gave gifts to people. He made some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to go and tell the good news and some to have the work of caring for and teaching God's people. Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith, that is, to have the unity of the faith. Of course, we're not there yet, so we still have the responsibility to continue this work of teaching. This work must continue to all join in the same reach, the unity of faith, and the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must become like a mature person, growing until we become like Christ and have his perfection. We've got work to do. I've got work to do. Then we will no longer be babies. We will not be tossed about like a ship that the waves carry one way and then another, and we will not be influenced by every new teaching. Every, you know, along by every wind of false teaching, some versions will have. And we hear people trying to fool or trick us. You know, of course, there is this all the time. I, you know, there's one person in in a congregation that I was that I was ministering to. It seemed like every week she came up with it. She'd listen to somebody, and she was taken in by the new teaching. <laughs> it was it was like, okay, what's what what is it now? And you'd have to spend, okay, this is what the scriptures actually say, not what this televangelist, what this whatever, what you know, this person who wrote this latest religious book, you know, that you've picked up and read. You know, at the used bookstore. You know, there's so many people who are who had, don't have the, as it were, you know, they're, they're, they're pulled off by every slide of wind, by whatever teaching is going, because they don't look at the Word of God. And we've had in the times as well, in the Church of God, that those who even had the offices which told them there was a time to teach, a time to speak up, they didn't speak up. They were intimidated. And they allowed many of God's people to be tricked and fooled by the antinomians, the lawless. They teach a, a gospel of lawlessness. Back to Ephesians 4. Yeah, 
they make plans or schemes, these false teachers, to try every kind of trick to fool people into following the wrong path. No, instead speaking, Paul says to the, the church, instead speaking, which even the Amplified can say, speaking can be also living out, practicing. Of course, we're living out and practicing. We should be also speaking about it. But speaking the truth with love, that's how we do it, love, we grow up in every way into Christ who is the head. The whole body depends on Christ and all the parts of the body are joined and held together. Each part, in this case, you know, each part, that is in some versions, you see each joint or each ligament. And you know, if we have a joint or a ligament that hurts, then we take notice that we have so many, <laughs> don't we? And we're, we're aware of that, but each part, each joint, each segment does its own work or has its own function in the church among the people of God, making the whole body grow and to be strong and, and to build itself up into love. In many ways, you know, the church is perpetuated because of our children, especially in this age when people are taking so much offense at Jesus and his teachings. And they don't want to hear it. <laughs> when was the last time a public broadcaster talked about the teachings of Jesus? Well, they don't, generally. They have anything they'll talk about, some sort of scandal that they can find out. Now, when we speak, obviously we want to speak in a way that we want to be understood. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19. But in church meetings, Paul is, says to the Corinthian brethren, I'd rather speak five words I understand in order to teach others than a thousand words in a different language. That is, to speak in tongues, this ecstatic language. I'd rather speak five words. Love, God, obey, commandments. <laughs> rather than sit there, blah, 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 blah. But we'll have whole congregations of people, denominations that do that, exactly that. But Paul says that when we speak, in the time to speak, speak to be understood. And how we speak now is also matters. Tone of voice, you know, how we, do, how we deliver it makes a difference too. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 17. Ecclesiastes says this, Words of the wise, spoken quietly, should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Ecclesiastes 10, 12. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious and win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. You know, in this day of social media, it's, it's, you know, it's so easy to come out with a flame, you know. <laughs> Twitter, you know, do your, you know, you, you have these things go on. It's waste of time. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious and win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. Ecclesiastes 12.10, 12.10. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. Finding the right turn of phrase, thinking about it, ponder it, something to consider to do. It is a time to speak, but how we do it makes a difference. It's the tone of the voice and how we put it together, the turn of the phrase even. And in so many of these ways, you know, when God speaks, you know, you look at some of the closest examples, the best positive examples, God, you listen to this. Let's go to Exodus 33 and verse 11. What kind of relationship? How did God speak with Moses? It says here in Exodus 33, 11 in the New Living Translation, inside the tent of meeting, that is the tabernacle, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. See, it's how he would speak to Moses, face to face as with a friend. It's, you know, you're... Because, friend, you want to encourage, you want to help, you want to build up, you want to be honest. And that's important. It's also, when we speak, when it is the time to speak, it's, it's, it's are we speaking respectfully? Are we speaking 
appropriately to those who are our peers or even to those who, who are our superiors, who have some sort of position of responsibility. This whole thing he, we have here and um, in Numbers, in Numbers 12, and uh, you have this chapter uh, where it talks about how Moses' sister and his brother spoke against him because of a Cushite woman who he'd married. Now, there's, you know, there's a lot of speculation on why that happened. But they were saying, has the Lord really spoken only through Moses? Has the I also spoken through us? And what does it say? And the Lord heard it. Better than the NSA. <laughs> Doesn't depend upon microphones or cameras. And the Lord heard it. Or, you know, intercepting internet messages. But he said to him, you know, God explained, he said, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. But it is not so with my servant Moses. He's entrusted, in verse 7, and faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth directly, clearly and openly and not in riddles. And he perform, beholds the form of the Lord. Why were you then not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the point that he's making here is that, you know, when God uses people, we've got to be careful about how we speak. You have to keep that when we say things, God hears us. He's listening to us. Is it, is it appropriate? Is it respectful? Even Titus, we go to Titus um, when Paul, you know, made this, made this point in, you know, in a Greco Roman society where slavery was a big deal. In Christianity, the Christian teaching was what? That he had the slaves, hey, you know, I've got my rights or whatever it might. You know, he looked at the situation, and it's a, there, there, there was an unequal situation, but the, Christ, you know, the church wasn't trying to foment a violent revolution, but it said this. His recommendation, he, what he was saying in Titus 2 9, it says, slaves, or, you know, bond servants, should yield, that is, submit to their own masters at all times, trying to please them and not arguing with them. You know, it's hardly a, an ideal situation. And Paul would say, if you could get your freedom, get your freedom. But if you're found in this situation, don't sit there and argue with your, you know, your bosses when you don't have, you know, you're not in charge from this aspect. It's, 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 it's a waste of time. Don't do it that way. There's a whole example here, and I'm running out of time. <laughs> you know, you have in 2 Chronicles chapter 10, you can look, re look at this later, 2 Chronicles 10 and verse 1 to 16. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam came into office. He became king. And the people had been heavily taxed for a long time. Solomon paid for all his good stuff by taxing the people. He was making it hard. And he asked his advisors, you know, the older guys who had been around for, for, for a long time about what he should do. And they said to him, they, and, and they, they, these, these older advisors said, if you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. See, just speak. You're in authority. Speak nicely. <coughs> Show them some concern. <coughs> Show them that you care for them. And they'll be your servants forever. They'll do everything you want. But Rehoboam, being a young guy, <coughs> he listened to young guys. He didn't, you know, says, why should I listen to this old, all these old guys? Common attitude right now. Very common attitude. You know, why would we do this? So, and, and, and the young guy said, I'll oh, just tell them to, to shut up, you know, and we're, you know, pay up, was, was essentially what they were saying, that I'm going to be, you know, if you thought my dad was hard, I'm going to be worse. Of course, that just resulted in a rebellion and the division of ancient Israel into the Israelite the confederacy of the northern ten tribes. And then you had the you do the Judahite or the southern kingdom of Judah with two or three tribes, depending upon how you want to count them. 
there were three tribes, Benjamin, Judah, and the, the Levites eventually had to go there because they were, had to leave. But anyways, if you are kind to these people and speak to them and speak good words to them, they'll be your servants forever. So, you know, it's the old story, you know, honey will attract more bees than vinegar. It's an old southern saying, honeys will attract more bees than vinegar, and it's really true. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 16, it says, you know, he's talking here, you know, God is counseling the people at that time, says, speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth and justice and peace. Do what you know is right and do the good things and your nation will be at peace. Speak those words. You also have the great example of words of reconciliation. Sometimes they can buy you time. 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, you have this whole account where David's on the run from Saul. Saul has got, you know, he's got a bad attitude towards David. That's the best way to describe it. He has a very bad attitude. He's jealous. He's envious. He's jealous and envious. Because he, he feels that the Spirit of God that had been with him had been withdrawn and was given to David. And he was going to, you know, take from him his position and his rivalry. If you are a Christian and you have the Spirit of God, and of course, if you are a Christian, you do have the Spirit of God because that, that's, that is the key. Okay, can't be a Christian, a real Christian, and not have the Spirit of God. There will be people who won't get along with you. They will be envious. They will be resentful. But what are you to do? What kind of words are you to have for them? Well, the whole example you hear is that when, that it shows here in 1 Samuel 24, David brought up words to try to make for reconciliation pieces. I'm not out to try to get you, Saul. See, I could have just killed you right now when you walked into the cave wherever I'm hiding in the back of the cave to do your business. I could have killed you, and many guys told me to get back at you right now, but I didn't do it. And I, I you know, it, I respect you. I'm not going to put my hand against your office just because you have it. And he bought himself some time because it actually made Saul look, you know, it was interesting. He felt, boy, I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not doing the right thing. And, he's, and he, he gave David a break for a while. It, he was able, it was a time to speak, and David spoke at that time, and he bought himself some reconciliation, at least temporarily. And all these things, the scriptures say there is a time for everything. A time to search, a time to give up as lost, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. Time to tear apart, a time to sew together, a time to keep silent, a time to speak. This is a time when we are to speak, when we have the opportunity. You know, we're not kings, we're not, you know, notable people, we're ordinary people, but we have, you know, for parents or grandparents, we're friends, we're co-workers, we have the opportunity to speak. How we speak is important. You know, how are we respectful? Do we do it? The tone of how we do it, our reconciliation. Remember what Jesus said. You know, and we don't want to be offended by Jesus' words. Okay, because in most, oftentimes in this society, people are offended at Jesus' words and his teachings. Very much so. Even the name of Jesus. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 13, 37, said previously, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. It is a time to speak, but let us be thoughtful of how we do this. This is indeed a time to speak, but let us be careful how we do it.